So it is 7.34 p.m. It is Tuesday, May 25th, 2021. This is the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger hey. Dupont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Sorry, here. And Stephen Revelack. Here. Wonderful. Good evening to all. On behalf of the town, uh, Rick Ballarelli. Here. And Vincent Lee. Here. And I don't believe there's anyone else in the town <laughs> We're waiting on for tonight. Um, <clears throat> and persons appearing for 83 Palmer Street, uh, Bob Anessi. Yes, I'm here. He's here. Fantastic. And uh, appearing for 34 Marathon Street, uh, the McGoverns are here. The name. There we go. Hi, I'm here. Oh, wonderful. All right. Hi. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order publicly suspends the requirement of an of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer, audio, or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> and where we are starting a new uh, hearing this evening, I'll just read the, the town's new land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as Monotomy and Algonquin word, meaning yeah. Cliff Waters, the board acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their name. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We will begin the this evening with several administrative items, including the approval of minutes, uh, and actually will not be the approval of minutes, sorry. Uh, approval of decisions and discussion on the board about uh, the future of online meetings. Um, these items relate to the operation of the board and such will generally be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. Um, after the introduction of each item, I'll invite members to provide any comment, questions, or motion. Please remember to mute your telephone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly. If members wish to engage in discussion with each other, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. <clears throat> so we have um, item number two on our agenda is the approval of the decision for 12 Christine Road. Um, the decision was written by Mr. Hanlon. It was distributed, and I believe everyone should have had an opportunity to comment on it. Um, are there any questions or further comment? Seeing none, may I have a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, draft final decision in tw for a special permit in 12 Christine Road be uh, approved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, members in favor, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. 
Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. The chair votes aye. That decision is final. Uh, this brings us up to item number three, uh, the approval of the decision for 53 Pine Ridge Road. This is another decision uh, written by Mr. Hanlon. It was distributed to the board for questions and comments, which I believe were received. Um, are there any further questions or comments in regards to the decision for 53 Pine Ridge Road? Seeing none, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that the draft final uh, decision in 53 Pine Ridge Road be approved. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. May I have a second? Second. Hi. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Call the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That decision is final. That brings us up to item number four on our agenda, uh, which is the discussion of post-COVID meeting protocols. So this appears to be a topic that is moving at an extremely fast rate of speed. Um, I had a conversation with uh, the town council at the time on Friday, uh, where it was looking like, um, it was the notes that are available on the town website, where um, sometime between the 1st and the 15th, we have to transition to being back, back um, in person. Um, subsequent to that yesterday, there are, are House and Senate bills now in the Massachusetts seeking to extend uh, some of the provisions of the relaxation of the open meeting law that are um, in effect because of Governor Baker's order from last March. Um, but apparently they're both attached to uh, the budget bill. So they would probably not get passed until the very end of June, um, which is of course after the, the date when we would need to transition. And then just this afternoon, um, Mr. Hanlon brought to my attention that Governor Baker spoke um, and he himself is introducing another uh, bill, which would actually extend, it appears it would extend all of the provisions possibly until September. Um, whether this is um, specifically to give towns uh, and cities an opportunity to come up with new policies, or whether this is just related to pre-existing summer vacation plans that necessitated the, the change, um, we don't know, but it appears that the, there will be uh, action in the state, hopefully taken before the 1st of June um, to extend the, the current provisions we're operating under. So that will give us and give the town an opportunity to figure out how we can move forward in a hybrid fashion. Um, at town meeting our, earlier um, this month, there was a, a study committee set up by the town in order to sort of investigate how best to implement this transition, but it looks unfortunately like we are going to have to implement this transition far ahead of when that committee gets a chance to, to really get going. So, um, <clears throat> That's more sort of an update on where things stand with this. Are there any any questions or comments from the the board in regards to this, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon, uh, I just wanted to point out that at least the news stories around the governor's announcement suggested that a part of the purpose of the of the announcement was to provide the legislature with an opportunity to study and to move forward on some more permanent mm -hmm. resolution. Just just as it, in many areas of life, some of what we've done during the pandemic, we intend to continue to do. Um, there's that sense in the legislature, there's some of that going on as well. And we're coming up against a deadline right now. So part of the idea is, is not so much to give the legislators a vacation over the summer, but to give them time to get their job done. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Mr. Revelak, Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelak. So, in, although under you know the current emergency order, uh, we basically have a window of between June first and June fifteenth to can you know to give thought to meeting again in person. I would be inclined to err on the later side, if for no other reason than you know I won't get my second uh, vaccination until early June. Um, yeah, so if for f as much as I miss seeing everybody in person, uh, <laughs> I am personally not um, 
in a rush to, to, to give up virtual meetings just yet. Good, thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close this topic for now. I'm sure we'll get additional, inform additional information. We'll probably be rolling in um, very soon from the state as to exactly what, whether uh, Governor Baker's action is approved um, and whether we're moving forward in that direction. So uh, I guess more details coming. So this brings us up to um, the public hearings for this evening. Um, now turning to public hearings on tonight's agenda, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves and make their presentation to the board. I'll then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I'll open the meeting for public comment. <clears throat> so the next item on our agenda is uh, item number five, docket 3658, 83 Palmer Street. Um, and appearing on behalf of the applicant is uh, Sir Robert Anessi. So yeah. why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself yes. and explain to us what, what you are looking to do. Yes, this is uh, Robert Anessi appearing for the applicants. And I have a rather uh, unique situation for me at least. I've never uh, encountered uh, this kind of a, uh, an appeal before. Uh, and I think Mr. Hamlin and Mr. DuPont may understand uh, the concept uh, that uh, uh, I would talk about in terms of it's almost like a complaint for declaratory relief. What I'm asking the board to do uh, is not to look at the situation presently as far as zoning is concerned. Uh, what I'm asking the board to, uh, to do is go way back to 1955. Okay, when the, this particular decision was written by the Zoning Board of Appeal. When it was written in 1955, essentially uh, what the board did is, the a board allowed an assemblage of a, uh, three lots, uh, basically uh, into two lots. And the two lots wound up being uh, subdivided into one containing 4,582 square feet that had a, a single family home on it. The other lot containing 5,504 square feet did not have a home on it. The, I'm given to understand of any kind. Uh, the, what the board did is, uh, the board basically uh, rendered a decision at the time and said that uh, the, uh, you could have the subdivision that you could have a single family house or a house, I shouldn't say single family, because it didn't say that at all, that you could have a house on the lot containing 4,582 and a house on the lot containing 5,504. So we have to go back to 1955 and try to view what the neighborhood looked like in 1955. And one of the ways that you can do that is by looking at the block plan uh, that might have existed then uh, and other matters as well. But if you look at the block plan and even look at the block plan today, I think what you'll see is that the lot containing 5,504 square feet was uh, one of the larger lots in the neighborhood. All of the lots I'm given to understand on the other side of Palmer Street, on the other side of 83 Palmer Street, were two family uh, buildings, two family lots. As I look at the block plan, I see two numbers. And the two numbers indicate to me that they were two family uh, dwellings. Uh, now, the, so the board certainly had that in mind. Uh, and again, I'm asking the board to do something that's unusual here. I'm, I'm gonna be requesting that the board uh, go back in time to 1955 if the board believes it has the authority to do so for the purpose of interpreting what the zoning board meant uh, when they sub, uh, subdivided that property into two lots. Why? 
because the, the then zoning board didn't indicate that the lots were to be for one family homes or two family homes. Now, my argument as counsel for the applicant is that the neighborhood even then consisted largely of two family homes. And the board and the collective members of the board must have been aware of that fact uh, back in 1955. And my position uh, for the applicant would be if the board meant to limit uh, the lot containing 5,500 square feet or either of the lots for that matter uh, to uh, a single family lot, then they would have said that in the decision. The problem is the decision is devoid of any of the uh, uh, matters that ordinarily would be contained in a zoning decision. Uh, there are no findings of fact with respect to how they concluded, whatever they concluded. Uh, and so there's nothing that we can look at for that, uh, to that effect. However, the other argument I make is notwithstanding that fact, uh, the board did come to a decision in 1955. And when they came to that decision, again, they knew the neighborhood was largely two family. They didn't say that the subdivision limited construction of the homes to a single family. Uh, and if they wanted to say that, they could have said that, but they never did. So my argument is that we all know that there's a 20 day appeal period with respect to any defect in a zoning decision, okay? Uh, and uh, you can make an argument here reasonably that there was a defect in the zoning decision. Why? Because they didn't make the findings of fact that they should have made uh, with re under chapter 40A even as of that point in time. Uh, but my position is that where they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they didn't certainly say that the subdivision was limited to one family homes and the 20 day appeal period expired that the, they meant, okay, uh, whether they meant it or not, that as far as I'm concerned, uh, my position would be that the bottom line is uh, that it, it was uh, a two family lot, okay? not a single family lot. Now, uh, I'm not asking that the board look to present zoning. If you, if you had to look to present zoning, we don't have enough square feet on the lot to satisfy the 6,000 square foot requirement, okay? So I'm not asking that the board do that. Uh, in addition, if we had to look to present zoning, I think there'd probably be a question of a large addition as well, because the if you, uh, I had the architect fill out the dimensional information, even though it would not be relevant to my argument, because my argument uh, isn't uh, whether it complies with present zoning. My argument is what was the intent on the part of the members of the zoning board back in 1955. And uh, I'm suggesting to the board that I filed an application for both a special permit and a variance because I didn't know what else to do in terms of getting the matter before the Zoning Board of Appeal. So I'm asking that the board step in at that point and help the, uh, the client out in terms of where we are and uh, perhaps interpret that decision from 1955 uh, and interpret it so that in fact, the subdivision uh, resulted in lot B becoming a two family uh, lot, uh, even though a single family house was constructed on it after the zoning decision. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Um, so just to clarify, is, has the building department stated that this is not a two family lot? The, I spoke with the building department and Rick Ballarelli would know this as well. And I was told that the matter should be determined by the Zoning Board of Appeal. 
And that's the reason why it was chucked up to the Zoning Board of Appeal. And uh, that's what happens in these situations where uh, there are gray matters and the building department perhaps doesn't feel that they have the ability at their level to make a determination. So it gets chucked up to you folks. That's what happened. And where in between 1955 and today, the town has on several occasions voted to adopt an updated zoning map um, in which this parcel is identified as a being within a two family district. So you're saying notwithstanding those votes, there is still a question as to whether this lot no, is allowed to have a two, two family. Out? It's a two family. Well, what I'm saying is that it's a two family, but that the subdivision allowed a two family building to be constructed on the lot in 1955, because I can't comply with the current lot uh, area requirement for mm -hmm. constructing a two family on this lot. I don't have 6,000 square feet. I don't have that. So if I had to comply with present zoning, that's a problem for me. I'd have to get relief for that with respect to present zoning. Okay. So you were, you were looking to amend the 1955 decision, not because it specifically precludes the construction of a two family house, but because by modifying the original decision, you feel it would allow you to construct a two family house by right? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm suggesting. That's what I'm, I'm suggesting that that was the intent on the part of the members of the zoning board in 1955, because essentially uh, that's pretty much what they said, okay? Mm -hmm. In their decision in 1955, uh, the proposal is quite in keeping with several other others already submitted to the board, which to pertain, pertain to lots in the block between Plymouth Street and Beacon Street. Uh, and the resulting lot lots would be as large or larger than the average lot, lot, uh, lots in the vicinity. Yes, you hit it on the head. That's what I'm asking the board to do. Okay. Um, thank you. I appreciate the, the clarification. Uh, members of the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, when was the house that is currently on the lot built? Say again, uh, Mr. Hanlon. When, when was the single family house that is currently on the lot built? On the lot built. It was built shortly after the decision, uh, maybe within a oh. year or so. Hello? Did, uh, did the, somebody jump in? Yeah. The assessor's records indicate 1955 as the year yeah, of construction. So maybe at around the same time, yeah, okay. within the year. Yeah. Was do you have any knowledge as to whether or not uh, any particular plans to build a house were before the board uh, at the time it made its decision in 1955? I, I do not. I have not seen any. I know that. Okay. Uh, and I, I did make in part, but I haven't seen any. I, if there are, I have not seen them. Is there any evidence that, well, I mean, I, I'm guessing the answer to this must be no, but when, when it was actually built, have you seen any of the papers that were submitted to what was then with the building inspector to know why it was that it was allowed? This one? Mr. Inessi, I'm losing you. I don't, we can't hear you very well. Yes, I'm sorry. You cannot hear me? I can now. Okay, all right. Uh, I do not, okay? I have not seen any plans, okay, when the house was built, okay? My argument, uh, of course, is that it wouldn't make any difference uh, because even if the house was built uh, as a single family, which it was, okay, my argument still is that you have to look at the zoning decision as it was written, okay, and what the zoning decision said. We're not talking, in my opinion, about what the, at the then owner of the property did to clarify the intent of the zoning board. Uh, we're talking about what the decision said for the purpose of clarifying the intent of the zoning. Board. No, I do understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand if there's evid any evidence as to what the building inspector thought 
when he was presented with the plans, but I gather that that is a subject on which we currently have no information. Um, the, would it make it, I'm trying, let me focus in on whether it's two or, or one. Um, if you were planning now to raise the existing single family house and to build another single family house there, would your argument before us be any different? You still don't have the authority to build, I mean, you still don't have an adequate lot to build a new single family house. So you seem to me to be more or less in the same fix you're in now. My, my, my argument, uh, I think you're right. Okay, I think your analysis is correct. Yes. So the real problem here is building anything on a non-conforming lot. Uh, well, I don't know that it's technically a non-conforming lot, but at least a lot that is too small. Um, I can agree on that. Okay. Um, do you have any understand? I this is the, you have no reason to necessarily be up on that, but in the, in the last six weeks, this is the second case that we have had in which uh, a long ago uh, board of zoning appeals zoning board of appeals has approved uh, an odd subdivision of lots that resulted in a a lot that was too that was non-conforming and that therefore and knowing that that's what it was doing uh and now we're in the situation of trying to figure out what to do about that do you have an understanding i mean what this looks like is an application for permission to do a subdivision and today of course as far as i know the board has does not have that authority at all so uh, it's not something that that we see in our normal business, but I have the sense that the board in those days had may have had powers that it was acting under that are not the power to issue a special permit or the power to issue a variance, but something else. And I'm wondering if if you have the knowledge to teach us as to what what authority the board was actually exercising here and what it, what and what the rules were what the what the statute is whatever i mean authorities don't come from just nowhere so where does this authority come from i, I certainly go back to i did not begin to practice law in the town until 1967 or 68 uh, but certainly uh going back to then uh i can attest to the fact that the zoning board did in fact uh, allow subdivisions uh, and they were doing so uh, in my view under the provisions of chapter 40a now if you're to ask me whether there is any particular uh, town bylaw that they were relying on i don't i don't know that to be the case but i think the catch-all and the umbrella for what the zoning board did in the early days uh, was, again, hanging their hat on chapter 48. This is, this is the last time I'll, I will yield to, to others, but um, when the, one of the things that is true in both of the decisions that we've recently read in which a 1960s or 1950s opinion, they, they, they do not seem to have regarded I mean, you would have thought that doing a subdivision that resulted in non-conforming lots would have been something they would be, if not think of themselves as prohibited from doing, at least uh, would be, be strongly co contrary to their doing it. And in both of these cases, the board really sa essentially said, we think it makes good sense to do this and it's in the interest of all the parties and so forth. And so we're doing it because it makes good sense. And I'm trying to get a sense of what sense that makes when you have a law that says that this is such and such is a, is a minimum. And I wonder if, if you can inform us as to what their thinking was back I, then. I think that the, in many instances, Mr. Hanlon, the board did take action based upon what made good sense in those days. Uh, we had some pretty illustrious uh, uh, figures on the zoning board going back uh, to the 60s and the 70s. Uh, we had as a chairman, Bob Muldoon, who was uh, essentially the head of the real estate uh, uh, the association for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a very well-known real estate attorney. Uh, we had Dick Keshen, uh, a very well-known real, uh, real estate attorney as well. And I think that 
you're probably looking at it correctly that in many instances, things were done, okay? Uh, again, under the umbrella of, we'll cite chapter 40 and, uh, A and say, we're doing it under 40A, but it was done because they thought it was the correct thing to do with respect to the facts before them at the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Inessi. Thank you. Mr. Revelak? This is... Um... You know, a question of um, you know, sort of looking at this from a different angle. But uh, this lot has more than 50 feet of frontage and uh, an area of more than 5,000 square feet. And if I my understanding is correct, Chapter 40A, Section 6 would allow the, the construction of a single or two family dwelling on such a lot, provided the Zoning Board of Appeals made a finding that the, uh, you know, the new building was not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Is, um, is, is that correct? This is a question for any of the I attorneys. Think that is, I think that <laughs> is the law. I think you're right about that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, would it be, so what I'm, what I'm kind of thinking, or my line of thinking is we, the Z, our Zoning Board of Appeals made a decision back in 1955, and they really haven't provided much insight um, as to what you know, their mindset was and what the rationale for making that decision was. In the absence of that ha decision ever having been made, I th think what we would be looking at today would be, you know, essentially an, an application of the vested rights provisions in Chapter 40A, sec Section 6. Um, and I'm just curious or looking for thoughts on whether that might be a more appropriate way to proceed or, or a, an appropriate way to proceed. One of the, again, I filed for both a special permit and a variance. So I think both are before you. And I quite frankly was looking for guidance from the Zoning Board of Appeal. That's why I did that. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Uh, Mr. Nessie, hello. I, as always, I am, um, you know, I appreciate the arguments that you're making and, and understand how you're getting to the point you have arrived at. I guess the thing that is a bit of a challenge for me is that, um, we, we're looking again, as Mr. Hanlon referenced, to a zoning board which was acting in another capacity perhaps, and I think maybe as a planning board um, on the one hand, because they seem to have approved a subdivision plan. On the other hand, they've cast it in terms of a special permit, which sort of brings it back to the regular um, type of work that the the zoning board does. And my initial question when I was reading your statement of facts was, were these two lots when they were combined and then um, separated out into new sizes of conforming in terms of area and frontage? But then I believe that in your argument, when you've highlighted it, which I appreciate, you said that the zoning decision, it says that the subdivision would create two lots was with less than the square foot area required by the zoning bylaw. So do I understand that correctly? That they you did, and that's what the zoning it? decision said as well. Yes. So that's always the challenge for me is on the one hand, if they make a decision, and I, I think as you've indicated back then at times they were, trying to make what they thought were common sense decisions given the facts on the ground. And at the same time, and, and oftentimes they'll just do that without any sort of comment. But here, 
they're actually acknowledging the fact that they're creating either one or two non-conforming lots. And so that's, that's a part of it that I have to really consider carefully because as we go along, if more and more lots appear on the horizon where there have been these decisions which were acknowledged to have been inconsistent with the provisions of the zoning bylaw at the time, I, I'm fearful that that sets a precedent. And I, I wonder, Mr. Chairman, if I know that the planning department is not going to comment on something along these lines, but I'm wondering whether town council would be able to give us some guidance because I do think it's a rather complicated question legally. So those are my concerns or mm -hmm. at least the, the facts that seem to uh, come uh, up for me to consider. And I'm again thinking town council might give us some help in, in sort of figuring out how to weigh those. Mr. Chairman. Nessie. This is Pat. No, actually, oh, sorry, it was Pat. me. Um, I just wanted to, I, I certainly think that's true. I think that this is not a one-off situation as we've come to realize. And the, the decision here itself uh, says that the proposal is quite in keeping with several others already submitted to the board, which pertain to lots in the blocks between Palmer Street and Beacon Street, which suggests to me that the board was already well acquainted with this situation and had, and there are another uh, of other opinions that may be similar to this one uh, out there. And so I, I think that we have to imagine that whatever it is that we decide ultimately in this case is something that may affect a number of other cases as, as well. And we need to be thinking sort of in, in, in that vein that we'll be laying down a rule of some sort and we need to be quite careful in considering as a matter of law just what that that rule ought to be. Further questions or comments from the board? Seeing none at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I'll now open the meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand to be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks that those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed. The board and staff will do our best to show documents. Are you gonna ask a question? Mm -hmm. So at this time, um, <clears throat> if you'd like to, to speak, please go ahead and in the participants tab, raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I would hope that when either making a decision or referring it to town council or, uh, you know, when establishing a precedent, I know you're trying to walk carefully here because I think as, as your members have clearly pointed out, this is going to come up probably with increasing frequency. Um, I would hope that either yourselves or, or whoever makes the decision here would take into account not only the written decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals in 1955, but also what occurred in this case the same year with the property. A uh, single family home got built um, and it was built on I guess not quite a conforming lot because my understanding of this is not that clear. And in making the decision of what to do now, I think you need to consider not only what a decision of the previous board was, and in this case, many, 50, 60 years ago, but also what's been done since. And 
I mean, had, for instance, two homes been built on two non-conforming lots, you'd be stuck with, a, you know, sort of the situation as, as built at that time. You're now stuck with a situation of one house, one single family home on what is a, maybe a non-conforming lot and you have to proceed from that fact, not from the fact that two houses were built on two non-conforming lots at the time. Now, forgive me if, if my lack of understanding of the situation uh, cl clearly points out that what I just said is ignorant. I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand what's going on here. But, uh, but I, think, I think the facts on the ground now and the fact that zoning is different now and the zoning rules are different now, it doesn't get, doesn't get all undone by the fact that in 1955, a certain decision was made based on the facts that were true at that time. Zoning and zoning in, in, my, in my perspective evolves and what matters now is different than perhaps what mattered then and just because a decision was made then based on the mores or, to, or points of fact at that time doesn't tie our hands in the fact that we expect now to follow the rules of zoning that have been established since and currently are in effect. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Heckley? If you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, name and address of the record, please. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted myself and it must have clicked again. Um, my apologies. Well. Uh, so my name is Philippe Ecli. I live on Palmer Street. Uh, uh, and uh, I, um, I live in a two family. Uh, it, is a, it is a two family. Uh, so, so there are some section of, of our streets that are zoned for two family and it's lovely. Uh, my concern is not about uh, whether or not uh, uh, a, um, the, the, there should be some kind of, uh, um, um, I can't find the word, sorry. Uh, so, so, some, um, my concern is not about uh, whether or not to allow to family. Uh, my concern is uh, that uh, the, the particular builder who seems to have uh, drawn the plans uh, has, has done a lot of houses, uh, one street over on Beacon Street. Uh, and uh, I guess there was uh, enough footage uh, on, on that street uh, to allow for this. But uh, I feel like uh, as a... Uh, uh, that uh, the, the particular type of construction that was put by that particular builder uh, is not enticing a very uh, close-knit community because it creates a, a different type of relationship. And uh, I think it, uh, it brings more divisions and it does uh, bring communion. And uh, in, in our particular block, uh, we're very proud of being able to have block parties and, and uh, a sense of communion. And we miss that since uh, COVID-19. Uh, and we're concerned that uh, the, the particular type of driveway that uh, the, the builder uh, seems to be uh, promoting is going to be detrimental to uh, the, the particular uh, social tissues that we have at the moment. That's my concern. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. Um, next on the list um, is Ms. Susan Brow. Name and address for the record, please. Hi, this is Andy Hazelton. Uh, I live at 99 Warren Street with Susan Brow, who's sitting Thank next to me. <laughs> but uh, I guess reinforcing what Philippe said, I, I don't think that we would necessarily be opposed at all to a two-family 
being built on the neighbor's lot, uh, as long as it were in keeping with the character of the neighborhood or the street, I should say, in particular. And uh, I don't think that the proposed design is, simply put, at all. And I would, re I would refer you to the excellent December 2020 residential design guidelines for Arlington, which explicitly are at variance with the proposed design, specifically with regard to the recommendation against parking that dominates the principal facade on page 43. And also uh, even more particularly with regard to the principle A1 that new development should be designed based on the relevant neighborhood block category and local streetscape pattern, which is defined on page 16 as two family town core. One of the primary characteristics is side yard driveways. So it seems to me that if Arlington takes its new and extremely excellent residential design guidelines seriously that it would frown on the proposal. Thank you, Mr. Houston. Anything further? Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. And uh, I have a question for the board. Um, I don't think I heard it said this evening, back in 1955, what was the minimum buildable lot size? Do we know? That's a very good question. We know that both of the lots that were established were not conforming, but I have, been, I have been unable to get my hands on a copy of the older zoning bylaw. Does it, Rick, do you know by any chance? Mr. Chairman, I can tell you we're trying to locate a 1955 zoning bylaw, which is a long shot, but I can test almost to 100% certainty that the lot size um, back in 1955 was uh, 50 feet of frontage and 5,000 square feet and probably a lot less. Having grown up in a development in Arlington uh, when I was a youngster back in the 50s, mm -hmm. that lot in a new development was 40 feet of frontage and uh, 4,000 square feet. So I can, I can say with probably 99.9% .9 certainty mm -hmm. that 1955, the lot size was 50 feet of frontage and 5,000 square feet, probably less. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, please, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I, I'm willing to bet for that other 1% uh, because the opinion of the board flatly says, at least as I mm -hmm. read it, that 5,500 was not adequate. Uh, and if that's true, then 5,000 couldn't be the minimum that existed at that time. And assuming that the whatever law established the minimum lot size uh, dealt in even numbers, I'm willing to bet that the even number at issue was probably 600, 6,000 square feet. Yeah, I mean, um, Mr. Um, just, Mr. Just, Mr. Just, Chairman. Uh, I just want to ask about that last statement by Mr. Hanlon. I'm looking at the decision now and uh, I can't find where it says that 5,500 um, was too small. Um, I do, my understanding of the situation then was that you had two lots back to back together comprising a little more over 10,000 square feet. Uh, one was 12 beacon and the other one was to be eventually become 83 Palmer. And what the board allows was to subdivide it roughly in half. Um, and I almost get the impression from that was that um, it created two buildable lots from that, but perhaps I'm um, reading it wrong. Mr. Chair? Please, Mr. Revelak. So in the in the materials uh, for the board, um, there is a, you know, we have a decision. Um, attached to the decision is a sketch of a plot plan. And the next page contains a handwritten note, which reads, to wit, to subdivide two lots, 
said subdivision would create two lots with less than the square foot area required by section 14b of the zoning bylaw so to me that re that to me that indicates well if we had a copy of the zoning bylaw from 1955 section 14b would give us the answer but whoever <laughs> clearly whoever wrote the whoever wrote this note and attached it to the sketch um felt that the you know the the two sizes provided were less than whatever number that was. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Seltzer, did you have further questions? I think that gets as close to it as we can. I hadn't seen that other handwritten section. I thank Mr. Revelac for that. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, Mr. Valerelli, I know the, uh, the building department has just moved um, from its longtime home over on Grove Street over onto Maple. Um, so the, the chance of, of locating the, the 1955 <laughs> is difficult at this time. I, uh, uh, Mr. Nett? Person, I tried to get it through the library. Okay. And I was unsuccessful, okay? Uh, COVID had something to do with it, I'm sure, but I tried a long time ago to get it oh, through okay. the library and I was not able to do that, okay? Have you tried the town clerk's office? That was the only other place I could think of to look. Uh, we called them as well, and okay. we didn't get any help there either, okay? So okay. Uh, uh, I'm thinking, uh, quite frankly, uh, as I'm listening to all of this, that, and my memory is going back to the 1960s, and I'm thinking that Rick Valarelli may not be wrong, okay? in terms of the then zoning uh, for lot area being 5,000 square feet and the frontage being 50 feet. So don't quote me on that until I have something in black letter law to look at, but that would be my memory, Mr. Hanlon, okay? Uh, just going back and searching my brain at this point uh, as to uh, what I remember from the 19, 60s and the 1970s. If that were true, Mr. Anessi, Mr. Chairman, if I could be allowed, Please. Um, then this would become a fairly, it seems to me at least, this would become a fairly straightforward, non-conforming lot problem now that at some point the law would have changed and increased the minimum lot size and uh, and Mr. Revelak would be right that section six that of 48 section six is would come into what play. would come into play yes. in the equivalent yes. provisions in our law. That's correct. I agree with that. That's one of the reasons I filed for both a variance and a special permit. Yeah. Okay. So I think it can be considered as Mr. Revelak is indicating uh, alternatively uh, under chapter 40A section six. And that would deal with the lack of uh, uh, correct lot area uh, or uh, conforming lot area today. Are there any further requests for comment from the public? There's no room. I believe Mr. Mr. Seltzer and Mr. Hazelton, I think, are both had an opportunity to speak. Do either of you look to speak again? Hearing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment period then. Um, so we have so we have before the board a request to essentially reconsider the decision from 1955 um, in the in a way that would um, allow the redevelopment of the lot by right, um, which would um, not take into account the, the changes in zoning that have occurred um, in the intervening time. Um, well, I'm asking that the board consider the alternative as well, as mm -hmm. raised by Mr. Revelick. Yep. Okay. Um, so if, just, just for argument's sake, if the board was to apply the current zoning bylaw um, to this property, currently it would be a it's a pre-existing non-conforming um, lot in a two-family district. And if the homeowner was looking to modify 
um, the existing home through a large addition um, or to renovate the home, then um, it would come before, if, it, if they were just renovating the home and they were not seeking to do a large addition, then they could do so on the existing footprint. If they were looking to enlarge the home beyond 750 square feet, it would require a special permit finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, <clears throat> and my, I guess my question to, to the applicant is, is, you know, it has said on a couple of occasions here to mod, quote, modify the home. Is the intent to renovate the existing home or is the intent to replace the existing home? No, the home? intent is to construct a new duplex. That's okay. the intent. So new foundation, new, yes. new everything. Uh, I did submit, as a, I've indicated, I did have the architect uh, prepare a dimensional form, which you have with the papers. Yeah. Okay. That uh, essentially shows that. Okay. Yeah. We have a we have the the proposed site plan, um, which yeah. gives the. I just wanted to confirm. So, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I don't want to sort of jump to the chase too much, but I. Um, I will not, I definitely will not feel comfortable moving forward on this until we've had a chance to have a thorough conversation with Mr. Heim about it. Um, it's both important, uh, it's legal, it's, it's technical, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there may be a range of different possibilities that, that might be, that, that might lend themselves to actually making a decision that make sense and, and could conceivably respond to some of the things we've heard from the neighboring residents. So um, I, I, I think that these fish aren't ready to fry and would like to take the time to mm -hmm. uh, consult as we did with the last one with Mr. Heim and, and try to consider this more carefully than we've had the opportunity to do so far. With, with that in mind, are there additional questions um, that you would like to raise at this time so we have a full set of information to discuss with town council. Uh, again, if it's going to be discussed with town council, I would like uh, the alternative to, uh, to be discussed as well, the chapter 40, 48 section six approach. I know I emphasized in my argument uh, the decision and mm -hmm. that the decision allowed this of right, okay? But again, I did apply for both a special permit and a variance. And I think that uh, there is a good argument uh, with respect to chapter uh, 40A section six, because the zoning bylaw got amended in 1975. Right. And I believe, I believe that's when the change occurred. Uh, I could be mistaken about that, but the, the change occurred with respect to lot area, okay? The size of the lot. Uh, and we, we predated that, of course, we're 1955 at the time the sub, uh, subdivision was allowed. And I would just ask that, uh, despite the fact that the zoning board at the time and the zoning boards at the time aren't as erudite as we are, okay, in terms of what they did, okay, that we don't simply push their decisions aside like it was nothing because when the decisions were made, people relied on them, whether in fact, uh, at the time they were wrong or not. And, and that's the whole point of having a 20 day appeal period. Once that appeal period expires, okay, generally the closet is closed. So again, if it's presented to town council, would you please present it both ways, okay? The way I argued initially, and also 48.6. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I don't actually disagree with any of that and think it doesn't go far enough. I, I, I would like to present a broad question to town council of what are the options here? Uh, there are essentially many options have been presented to us and there may be ones that no one has thought of yet. And I think that we need to approach this with, with an open mind and figure out you know, what the right way is for dealing with this case. And it would be a mistake to try to put too narrow a question to him. He just need, I think he needs to work with us in order to explore the possibilities and guide us to exercising our judgment as to which legal option is the most appropriate uh, for the town and for the neighborhood and for the applicant. 
I'm open that to link. that, certainly. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Revelak, I know you had your hand up. Yeah, so, uh, I have two points. Um, one is, the first is to concur with Mr. Hanlon, at least to make, for myself to feel comfortable in making a section six finding, I'd, you know, I would need to, I would really need to see architectural drawings, or at least, you know, something more than a, a certified plot plan. Second, um, and this falls under the care, case of more options, but um, I, suggest that Mr. Anise might wish to review the language in warrant article 38, which was adopted by town meeting last night. Um, you know, it basically under certain conditions allows the complete reconstruction of a of a, a dwelling on a non-conforming lot subject to certain energy efficiency requirements. Um, I just present, mentioned this as an option. It's it's really brand new, um, but I haven't heard about uh, it, Mr. Revel. Yeah. Okay. It just okay. just maybe something you would like to uh, bring I'll to your look client's at it attention. For sure. Yep. Thank you. You are. further comments from the board, Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> I just wanted to. This is not exactly a question to Mr. Heim. But there's there's been the sort of music that's been left on the dominant and the tonic note about the about the uh, uh, compliance of the lot back in 1955, I think is in the legal notice, which says that said the subdivision would require two lots with less than the square foot area required by section 14 B of the zoning bylaw. This was in the legal notice that went out calling for the hearing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so with that in mind, um, I think the board should look to continue this hearing, um, and I think it would be prudent to have um, Mr. Hanlon and perhaps one other um, speak to Council Heim um, in the intervening time uh, and be able to report back to the board. Um, that the continued date. Uh, so we currently have, today is the 25th. Um, we have a hearing scheduled for the first, but I think that's too quick. Um, that also coincides with 1165R. We have a date in our calendar for Tuesday, June 8th, which currently is um, unused. And then, but uh, Thursday, June 10th, we do have um, a hearing for Thorndike Place scheduled, and that will be um, a considerable yeah, I, hearing. I'd rather stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would strongly encourage it. Um, does, do any members- would June 8th work for the board? I was just just going to ask that very question. Is there other is there any member of the board is unable to make Tuesday June eighth? Seeing none, why don't we? Um, I'll move that the back to here. Um, uh, that the board um, continues. Uh, eighty three Palmer Street, docket number three six five eight, until. Tuesday, June 8th at 7.30 p.m. Mr. So Chairman, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry uh, Mr. Mr. Hanlon. Um, just before we vote, that day works fine, but uh, would you remind me what other dates we have on the calendar real quick? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and I'll come back to this at the end of the hearing as well, um, but just for those who are in attendance. So Tuesday, June 1st is a continuance of 1165 RMS Ave, which is the uh, comprehensive permit hearing. Yep. Um, and Thursday, June 10th is a continuation of Thorndike Place, which is a different comprehensive permit um, hearing. Uh, third, and then we have, those are the only two hearings we currently have scheduled. And then beyond that, we have milestone dates of Thursday, June 25th, which is currently the close of the public hearing on Thorndike Place, and Friday, July 2nd, which is the close of the public hearing on 1165 on Mass Ave. So I guess my only comment would be, Having multiple, you know, having back to back, two two meetings a week is a lot. 
and uh and that would put two meetings if i read that right one mm -hmm. on the 8th and one on the 10th and then one on the did you say the next one would be the 25th so the, the 25th is just a it's a milestone date so it's the date we have to close the hearing by but we don't have anything scheduled for that date i, I guess my comment would be can we not have two on every week or any week i mean uh, if we have to do it under special circumstances, that's fine, but we did it last week and, yep. uh, I, I don't think the intents to wear us out, um, <laughs> would, would Tuesday, June 15th work for people? Mr. Oh, Chairman, I can do day. that if we're, if we're virtual, but I will be mm -hmm. out of the, out of the area physically okay. during that period. I can do it. Okay. We would still have five members who are present today who would be available then, um, but I am very hopeful that you will be able to participate remotely still during that time. Um, Mr. Nesson, does that work? date work better for you? Work I'll, for you? I'll, I'll take whatever date uh, is good for you folks. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Ford. Does that work, date work for you? It does. That, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Um, so in that case, I'll amend my motion uh, that we continue um, this hearing on 83 Palmer Street, docket number 3658 to the uh, Tuesday, June 15th at 7.30 p.m. May I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, and voting, uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelack? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 83 Palmer Street. Thank you everyone for your participation in this hearing. This brings us to the next item Thank on our docket. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Um, the next is uh, 34 Marathon Street, docket number 3655. This is a continuance of a hearing from May 11th. Um, so we had at the, the previous hearing, we had requested um, some additional information to be provided and the applicant uh, was to work with uh, Mr. Valarelli in um, coming up with some of those responses. So Mr. Valarelli, if you could uh, let us know uh, what has transpired in the past two weeks. I can, Mr. Chairman. So um, as requested, I reached out to the architect of 34 Marathon Street for some um, more finite numbers of the, um, of the existing structure. So basically without getting into a long spiel, um, they basically have a structure that um, contains I'm sorry, on the second floor of that structure, it contains 1,269 square feet of living space. They are asking to uh, construct a dormer in the attic of um, seven feet or greater from the underside of the roof framing to the finish floor below of 627 square feet. That in fact puts them at a 49% uh, area that is seven feet uh, or above. Um, and it complies to the half story definition. It's in fact 49%, um, but it is uh, less than um, half. All other factors of the house are okay. Um, it, it's the typical request that the board has heard many times. There is no open space usable. It falls short of the 25 foot minimum um, distance so therefore even that area in the backyard does not qualify even though there's a patch of land uh, that uh, may look like it does but in fact I think it's 23 by 40 something the plot plan is listed on Novus. So the long and short of it is the basement is not being used that wouldn't qualify anyway with the ceiling height is less than seven feet as it is. No living space is planned for the basement. We have the first floor second floor with uh, 1200 and change square feet they're asking to develop some living space in the attic, which is 49% of the floor below. So it qualifies as a half story. I can answer any other questions. I did take the liberty of redoing the entire application uh, that is also posted on Novus. If the board has any questions, they can direct it to me. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Valerelli. Mr. Hanlon. Um, 
I just wanted to ask about uh, landscaped open space uh, because as I was reading the charts that just says over 10% or something like that. And I, and I, I'm, what I, I guess I would like to know is whether we think we have enough information to conclude uh, that there won't be any uh, extension of a nonconformity if there, or if there is a nonconformity even about landscape open space. So if you could just tell us what the status of that is, that would be great. That is correct, Mr. Hanlon. So the open space does far exceed 10%. I didn't calculate it out, but it, it far exceeds 10%. The only um, expansion on the existing nonconformity is the usable open space. So we're looking to expand the nonconformity, whereas it's zero, zero to begin with, zero at the end of the day, but it is in fact increasing living space on an already nonconforming uh, piece of land. Yep. And you, by the way, uh, you, you raise a great point because uh, the, the, the zoning bylaw does not tell us to uh, separate landscape um, open space. Uh, and usable open space. You don't kind of have two chunks of land, one being designated as landscape and the other one being designated as um, usable. You can, in fact, um, theoretically use your usable open space as landscape space. So not to get too crazy with this thing, but it doesn't separate it. So that being said, if one has usable open space, they have landscape open space by default. Further questions, Mr. Hanlon? No, thank you. Um, just along those lines, to the to the homeowner, are there any plans to do any any work um, either with the the driveway or any of the walkways around the house? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, sir. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, no, the driveway will stay as it presently is, and there is a already pre-existing walkway that will stay as it is. Well, the sidewalk we will probably improve upon because the cement was cracked. Yeah. But other than that, um, no. We're going to, you know, just do exterior improvements as far as, you know, replacing shingles and- It's the residing. The residing type of thing where it needs to be and painting and improving that way once that we do it all at the same time. Okay, perfect, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could add to that, because it was a question posed to me at the last hearing. So they, it's have, early. yes, they have four uh, parking spaces. They only need two. Okay. Last call from the board before I open up for second round of public comment. Seeing none, um, so I'll go ahead and reopen the, this hearing for public comment. Um, as per the previous hearing, members who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. If you are participating by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by myself and asked to give your name and address and if you're given time for your questions and comments. So, any public comment at this time? Seeing none, going once, going twice. We'll go ahead and close the public comment for this evening. So any further discussion for the board or we does someone have, um, do we want to discuss um, possible conditions on the granting of an approval? We have our Mr. Chair, Mr. Revelak. Um, you know, I of course I'm eager to hear from my fellow board members, but I can't think of anything in particular beyond the standard conditions. Thank you. He does. So the standard three conditions uh, which the board applies for special permits. The first one is that the plans and specifications provided approved by the board for the permit shall be the final plans and 
specification submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington. In connection with this application for zoning relief, there has been no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two, if the building inspector is hereby notified, he should monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he determines that violations are present and the inspector of buildings shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21B and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the inspector of buildings may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action, also in accordance with section 3.1. And number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, is there further discussion on this or any other conditions the board feels are necessary for the proceeding with this application? Seeing none, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the board approve the uh, application for uh, the, the Marathon Place property, Marathon Street property, um, subject to the three standard uh, conditions that were just read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Oh, excuse me. Um, so for a vote of the board, um, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Uh, and Mr. DuPont? Sorry, Mr. DuPont, I couldn't hear you. Um, uh, thank you. Aye. Um, and in the absence of Mr. O'Rourke, um, Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes, uh, so the, that motion is approved. So, um, so, so the board is issuing a, a preliminary approval on this, um, pending the approval of the written decision. Um, and our next, that should be hopefully be voted on at our next scheduled hearing, which would be uh, next Tuesday, June 1st. Mr. Hanlon, does that sound fair? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I've already written half of it and I'll oh. write the other half and we'll have it by then. Perfect. So we, are, we are approved, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Appreciate sure. all your time and efforts. No, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, if you have any, any further questions, Mr. Valarelli is- He's a man. Help. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Valarelli. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, just a quickly for uh, the board and for any members of the public who are um, interested in following along, there are, are upcoming meetings um, that are scheduled. Uh, so, Tuesday, June 1st at 7.30 p.m. is the continuance of 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, Thursday, June 10th is the continuance of Thorns Lake Place. And now Tuesday, June 15th is... <clears throat> excuse me, the continuance of 83 Palmer Street. And then beyond those um, meeting dates, we have two milestone dates. Um, Thursday, June 25th is the close of the public hearing for Thorndike Place. Actually, pardon me, that is a Friday. Friday, June 25th is the close of the public hearing for Thorndike Place. And Friday, July 2nd is the close of the public hearing at 1165 Art Massachusetts Avenue. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's participation and patience throughout the meeting, especially wish to thank uh, Rick Valorelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording in this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. Our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. Um, and so to conclude tonight's meeting, may I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Mr. Chairman, before I move to adjourn, I'd like, if, if it is okay, I'd like to especially underline 
the contribution that Mr. Valarelli has made to help uh, the McGoverns through the, some of the arcane aspects of, of our process. We, we've tried to become as user-friendly and an agency as, as we can, and we have a somewhat Talmudic uh, uh, document to, to deal with. And uh, Mr. Mr. Valarelli really kind of has gone beyond the normal scope of duty just just to be helpful, and I would like to express my and I think our appreciation to him for doing that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hanlon, and all of you guys have as well. Yes, ditto. Thank you, Mr. Valarelli. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. So, thank you very much. May I have a second? Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Seeing none, the board is adjourned. Thank you all so very much.